Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us to another CMC Masterclass session. My name is Ricardo. I'm the Senior Content Manager um, at CMC. And I'm joined today by Trevor O'Neill. Trevor, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Trevor, I've, I've done my best to kind of summarize your experience in one sentence, which I'll say now. Um, but after that, I, I'd really hope that we briefly you give us a, a summary of your background, how you've gotten to this position. Uh, many consider you to be a technical analyst, authority, a fund manager, and you have 40 years uh, of stock market uh, experience, and you're a veteran in that space. Um, is, that, is that a fair introduction, and what would you add? To yes, that? it is. Uh, I, you could put it down that I'm, I'm very old, and I've been doing this all my life, <laughs> um, but, uh, but not only in equities, but also in derivatives and foreign exchange as well. But uh, yes, I've been a technical analyst since I was 18 when I was employed by Merrill Lynch and, and, and uh, they taught me technical analysis uh, because uh, the, my job was to be a trader on the coffee exchange. And if you're a trader, obviously you have to be a chartist. And, and so they, uh, I was mentored in charting. So it started right back then. Great. Um, and certainly a lot of our conversation today will be revolved around your experience, uh, around revolving around current markets, but also what you can teach our audience today from that wealth of experience since you started, obviously, uh, um, however many years ago it is now. Um, but to, to quickly summarize just about the relationship we have uh, between CMC and RG Essential Research, uh, you and Julia started off with working with CMC to, to introduce uh, a, 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 you know, a, a wealth of products. Uh, we call it um, RG Momentum Plus. Uh, can you just talk to me a little bit about more of, of that and what you look at particularly in momentum and, and the strength of, the, of that momentum? Yes. Um, um, uh, Julius and I uh, um, have been friends um, for, uh, for more than 30 years. We met, um, I was uh, uh, amusingly uh, uh, tell people that we met uh, at um, King's College, Cambridge, which is literally true, but we, but it was the summer holidays and uh, there was a conference there and, uh, and at that conference we met, neither of us went to King's College, Cambridge, <laughs> but um, we did meet there. And um, uh, Julius was at the time uh, a sell-side sell equity broker um, at a big uh, a Dutch institution and, uh, and I was working as a, as a broker and um, I uh, and um, my 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 own career was moving more towards uh, fund management. He had developed uh, the the uh, first stages of relative rotation graphs, and um, uh, this was proved very popular with uh, with the uh, the institutional fund managers and analysts of showing them in one picture um, lots of information where they could compare like with like together. Uh, I, um, and we're going now into the late 90s, um, became global head of technical analysis at Bloomberg. And, and we were able to get uh, the RRG charts, rotation graphs onto Bloomberg, then uh, after that onto Infinitive and to other platforms too, where it is used a lot by um, uh, particularly uh, portfolio managers because it's for looking at a lot of things, comparing a lot of things. Um, uh, since then, uh, uh, we've, we've both moved on. I went into hedge fund management and then now I manage my own fund and, um, and also do consultant uh, technical analysts for a number of uh, firms. But uh, working with CMC, and uh, CMC has uh, uh, the excellent products, the uh, RRG Momentum Plus products, which is a quantitative approach to the message of relative rotation graphs. Let me explain the concept of relative rotation graphs. You can see here we've got a quadrant, um, uh, four quadrants, and this one is labeled leading, this one is labeled weakening, this one lagging, and this one improving. Now, the idea of relative rotation graphs is you can put something in the middle in the crosshair of it and then compare other things to it. Now, it could be the S&P in the middle and then the stocks, the 500 stocks of the S&P and how they compare to it from two different aspects. But it can be literally anything. It could be the S&P in the sectors. It could be the S&P and um, uh, or, or it could be uh, stock indices like we, we have here. It could be currencies versus the dollar. So I'm going to show various different versions of this. So we take a benchmark. Now, in this case, the bench, benchmark is, um, is cash. OK, so how are uh, the uh, G10 uh, currencies performing versus cash? We could 
uh, have chosen, for example, a, a benchmark of the um, MSCI World Index. So we could look at the, the um, performance of um, the behavior of uh, these G10 indices versus uh, the, a, an average of the world. But in, but and that would could be that um, uh, 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 that we're um, uh, dissipated all, all across the graph with some underperforming and overperforming the world. But if the world, as an average, is performing weakly, we'll have some outperformance in on a relative basis, so relative to the world average, but not on an absolute basis. The stock index could be going down, but going down more slowly than another index. But this one I'm showing you here is showing you the uh, performance of stock indexes versus cash. So everything on the right hand side of 100 here um, is, is, is outperforming on a relative version uh, uh, basis versus cash. And the things furthest to the right are most outperforming and furthest to the left, which is a, you see as the Nasdaq here, is, is, um, is, is the worst performing. Then we've got another axis, the y-axis, y which is the momentum of this outperformance. So we've got two, two aspects. We've got not only what's strongest and what's weakest, but how is it behaving in that list? And this is really the advantage of relative rotation graphs. Um, so what we can, and also you can see there's a tail to this, and this is a, um, a, a weekly sample um, oh, and so this is now, this is last week, the week before, the week before, the week before, the week before. And you can see the Hang Seng has got a very long tail. This means it's moved very rapidly and quickly. Uh, where has it moved? It's moved from the um, improve, uh, improving quadrant and far over to the left, by far the furthest to the left. So in other words, the worst performing index on a relative basis to uh, right uh, up here. Now, this is uh, one of the big advantages of uh, relative rotation graphs is we saw this early and in our CMC reports um, right at the beginning of December, we, we picked up that the Hang Seng, which had gone down all year on a relative and absolute basis, it had been the worst um, major index um, and it was a real dog and uh, nobody was interested in it. But um, we, we saw that this long term downtrend in on a relative basis compared to other things was breaking to the upside. And this was it shooting round here. And we picked up uh, that and we um, and uh, we recommended some individual uh, securities using um, a, the next step down, which was to find uh, securities which had high momentum in the Hang Seng index and we used the ROG to help us select that so here then we put the Hang Seng in the middle and we put the stocks around that and we picked up the ones which uh, looked most appealing to us to participate in what we saw as a relative breakout from a weak position into look where it's gone now it's not a dog anymore at all in the moment I will uh, show you a, an individual graph of the Hang Seng. It's, it's broken the long-term downtrend and it's made a bottom and it's starting to go up. But we've got some, here we've got an interesting pattern looking at the other indices. Um, we've got um, a little bit of a curving down, so a little bit of a weakening, but what we've got over further is to the right, DAX, stocks, CAC. Okay, so European if you like European heavyweight uh, stock indices, we've got the uh, the FTSE um, over here, um, and uh, and then uh, the S and P over here, closest closer to the um, the hundred percent level. We've got the um, the Russell um, down here, and the Nasdaq right over here. So we have the Nasdaq right across here. So the um, the picture is a very split one in the United States. Um, so we've got something as far over as here and something over here in the Dow and the NASDAQ. Um, so uh, quite different from each other. So we've got a split personality in the United States. We've got Europe uh, crowding over on the right hand side. So we've got a strong message of European outperformance there, which which has, has existed actually um, for um, a number of weeks now already. So I hope the the concept is clear. If if you if uh, if you take the Hang Seng for example, this uh, this is moving 
in a northeasterly direction. It's moving between naught and 90 degrees on a compass here. Um, moving easterly means that it's increasing relative um, uh, performance, um, uh, relative strength, and northerly means with positive momentum. So this is a good thing getting better. And the Nikkei um, here is close to the benchmark, but it's heading in a southwesterly direction. Westerly means underperforming, southerly means with low positive momentum. Being close to the um, the benchmark, in other words, close to cash, the benchmark is cash here, is, is the um, uh, means that it's correlating with whatever is in the middle, in this case, cash. So you can't get outperformance of cash in the Nikkei. But things that are furthest away from crosshair in the middle are things which are, are, are offering genuine alpha of outperformance. So these are the things that we look for. The position left, right, um, relative strength and relative weakness, high and low with positive momentum and, and lower positive momentum and the, the direction in which they are rotating. And you see there's a general clockwise journey that the securities take. So the Hang Seng you know, may uh, move on further and one day it will come round here. Um, so these have been pushing ahead nicely and that now they're easing back very slightly. Uh, but there's nothing, nothing to indicate any reason to worry about the um, uh, the outperformance and the more attractiveness of the European markets over the US markets um, at the moment. Yeah, that, that that is interesting. I mean, just looking at hard markets, and you kind of identified where that positive momentum is at the moment. Um, I know you're not a, a fundamental, um, or you're not fond of the fundamentals of the market. You're very much a technical analyst. You look into uh, your charts, you, you do your own analysis of it. Um, obviously, it is a news-driven market at the moment, and we saw today from the inflation numbers uh, that certain movements have, you know, have favored uh, the equity market. We've seen the Nasdaq, the S and P uh, rally even further. Uh, the dollar perhaps is even weakened further. Um, but from a from a technical perspective, what I'd like to know from you is: Are we potentially starting another significant bull versus a bear market? Do you see anything there? Um, Carla, let me, there's two questions there. You know, first, first of all, I'm very um, uh, uh, keen to resist ever using the F word, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I don't talk about fundamentals at all. Um, and I don't understand them. I find them um, uh, uh, difficult to interpret. And I think even people who claim uh, to know how to interpret it, clearly they find it difficult to, to interpret as well. Yeah. But um um, talking about, for example, we had the CPI data mm -hmm. today, which was much anticipated, and there was, you know, for days um, the market has more or less been paralysed in in waiting for this, you know, this message about um, inflation and um, the intentions of, of the Fed, and a lot of sort of expectation was built into what would be the message of today, and this was led very much by the rhetoric of economists and 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 this and, and uh, you know. Technical analysis sort of uh, um, accepts that the market is driven by supply and demand, um, but it is also how people react to the supply and demand. And um, I'm afraid to say a lot of the tension in the market is built up by expectation, which is built up by um, uh, people uh, like, like economists and analysts and, and television people and people like yourself, you know, building up the expectations and excitement for these levels. And then very often the economists get it wrong, massively wrong, actually. And we have a, what's called a surprise, but it's only a surprise because it wasn't what the economists uh, said it was, it was going to be. And traders have positioned themselves for that. And so people are positioned for a certain outcome and then it happens or it doesn't happen this time. It uh, was pretty well in line of it and, and the market is a bit relieved about that and it's steady. But it, essentially the response to the market is behavioural. Um, it is, it's not the news itself, it's the expectation and hopes uh, for the news and the positioning of traders which cause these violent um, news-driven, so-called news-driven events. Very few new, news uh, market moves are actually genuine shocks in the market. It wasn't a shock that the CPI came out today. We were all waiting for it. We were counting down. Yeah. It. And it might have been shocking, but it, it wasn't mm -hmm. a surprise. Um, I, you know, an assassination is a surprise. A 
uh, default is a surprise, uh, profit warning is a surprise, those are surprises, genuine surprises, but um, mm. economic data is not a surprise, we just build expectations which are often wrong <laughs> about it, and that's yeah. what causes the surprise effect. Um, so for the second part of, yeah. of your question, which would would you mind just saying it again so I make sure I answer it precisely correctly? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think the, the second question is on the basis of not looking at the fundamentals, looking purely from a technical perspective, um, are we starting to see another significant bull versus bear market? Um, as you said, you know, there's, there's a shock in the market at the moment. Are they in the, the right way? Are they priced in the right direction? Or what does the um, what does your data tell you? Yes, I, I think uh, we're talking here about the U.S. stock market as the sort of global leading stock market, and we can see from this RRG graph that um, it itself is split. Um, we've got over here um, uh, the Dow, and if you and in a second we'll look at the Dow chart, and actually the Dow chart looks great, and it's looked great for a while, and then we we'll look at the Nasdaq. And uh, the Nasdaq doesn't look so great, and it hasn't looked great for a while, and that's positioned it. So, they, so you've got um, a market which is kind of split. Um, uh, some parts of it are looking quite good. Some parts of it are looking uh, pretty heavy. So let's indeed uh, go and look at that now. Here we've got the S&P, which is uh, most people's sort of benchmark. Um, and um, uh, uh, of course, we topped out um, in, in January. In fact, uh, the, the, high, the, um, the high of the year was, was actually the 31st of December um, and of last year. And then since then, that was it's been the high of this year so far. And we've come down. We've come down in clear waves, impulse, reaction, impulse, reaction, impulse, severe reaction, and this reaction being quite big in percentage terms uh, indicates that the bulls are getting more uh, you know, confident. Then we went on and made a new low here in, in October 2022. This is a weekly chart of it. Um, and I've put on here the, the moving average convergence divergence, the MACD. And what we've got here and this is often a very good indicator in, uh, of, uh, of changes in direction in markets, is a bullish divergence. So this is a low and, and a higher low, low, higher low, whereas low and lower low. So as we came down here, we had low, 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 higher low. So divergence, disagreeing. And, and so this is a warning of a potential uh, bottom in the market, it's it's an increasing reluctance to sell it. Is is what that message is. You can see we saw it at the top, didn't we? Here we were going up, high, higher, high, higher, high, all the way up in here. Here just about a higher high, but then in this phase here, I know it was an extended period. It was lasted one quarter, but we had lots of momentum on the upside into the end of the year, and then a clear divergence uh, into the top in here. So we, we could uh, draw that line, I'll draw it in now. Um, so we had a divergence in here, there. So, and I think that we've got a, a divergence in here. Now, low, lower, low, low, higher, low. Now the question is, is the S&P the right thing to buy? Um, maybe the uh, the uh, right thing might to be the uh, to to go into the thing which has been hammered hardest, uh, which is the Nasdaq, the tech heavy uh, Nasdaq. So I will I will look at this uh, next. Yeah, you know, it's interesting just about the Nasdaq as well. I know last week when we were doing our uh, weekly RG uh, video, you were talking there were alarm bells. There might be alarm bells for the Nasdaq. Um, or else we looked at a possible double top pattern to play out for the euro dollar. We'll speak about those currencies later, but um, we saw this week as well, these stocks uh, posting 52 week highs. That's when momentum take. Uh, then those hitting the 52 week lows. Last night, we saw the, the, you know, the interest rate sensitive index rally as well. The tax stocks were but a bit optimistic towards that CPI inflation data today. So, I guess I'm quite keen from a technical perspective. What are we looking at now? Well, um, we, we saw from the RRG how um, the NASDAQ was still in that um, uh, weak uh, quadrant, um, but uh, it and it it went down in a rather orderly uh, down channel um, uh, during 2022, got savage there. Now, what, what has happened is we've got low, lower, low, lower, low, lower, low, then 
essentially the same low. So it's, it, it has broken the pattern of making lower lows, which is the definition of going down. That doesn't mean it has to go up uh, as yet, but it, but it's, uh, it's stopped going down. It's done to uh, this sort of um, support level 11,000, uh, high, low, high, uh, low and low here, low. Um, and so this was a sort of recognized um, uh, level for it. Again, we've got for, uh, for support. Uh, again, we've got um, a bullish divergence uh, in place, low, higher low, after a series of lower lows in here. And so this is at the very least an indication of um, uh, loss of momentum on the downside. But undeniably, we're still in the down ch uh, turn channel here. Um, we'd have to move through um, 11,700 uh, before we were uh, taking that out and confirmed, uh, uh, you could confidently say that the downtrend is over if we broke 12,000, that's, that's a long way uh, from where we are now, of course. Um, but what this one suffers is a lot of uh, resistance levels above. Um, we're a long way from, from the high here in percentage terms. And it, it's, um, it, it, as, as it, if it does go up, as it does go up, it's going to re, um, reach barrier after barrier of resistance. It's going to find it hard to go up. And so if the, the market is, uh, the US market is turning generally, this one will be a reluctant participant in the bull market, even if it does turn up itself. It's not looking like the Hang Seng was um, at the beginning of December, like it's really bombed out and um, ready to swing round hard. It's not at that stage uh, yet. It's still uh, looking like it's going to underperform the other indices. Okay, here, this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Of course, narrowly based uh, average, uh, not uh, uh, populated with uh, tech stocks. Uh, it's uh, populated with boring old uh, things, uh, companies which make things. And, um, uh, and this uh, index is looking a lot better chart wise. So here it's come down, yes, from the high. Uh, we've got three points um, on the downtrend line. It, to, to me, it broke up uh, in November, um, came back, retested uh, the downtrend line. And this is often happens when you have a major breakout, you have a retest and it's bounced from it. Um, it has also got the bullish divergence, see low, lower, low, lower, low, lower, low, lower, low. That's that one. Then higher low in here while the price made. So we were warned in here that this could be making a new low. It did so at a very obvious to um, a technical analyst um, uh, it, uh, point, which is 29,000 uh, um, here, this high here, and that low there. So this was a significant uh, support um, resistance uh, level and, and uh, participated in the, the big crash uh, that we had. And so um, this uh, was a significant resistance point, becomes a significant support point um, when you meet it from the other side. So this was a, rather a thing of beauty as, as far as a technical analyst is concerned. But look how close we are now. We are to the high uh, here now. So compared to the NASDAQ, which has got layers of resistance before it gets back to its high, this one is within striking uh, distance of it. So 34,800 is, um, is minor resistance, I would say. So that's the breakout return and the breakout. Then the next level uh, resistance level would be 35,500 and then the high uh, back up uh, here at 37, more or less 37,000 uh, there. And so this to me, um, is it's uh, there's a message here, which is that the um, uh, technology aspect is um, is still a wait, and uh, maybe there's still more bad news to come in in that group of areas. But here, the um, old um, uh, solid manufacturing uh, type of uh, companies is um, is likely to lead the whole market up. So it is very split the U.S. Uh, market. But as you said, the breadth is improving. But what is make what are making two um, uh, new highs and you know fifty two week highs and above their fifty and two hundred day average? That is populated um, by uh, the type of stocks which are um, more involved in the uh, manufacturing aspect. And what are still making new right. fifty two week lows is the technology stocks. Right. Well, that that is interesting. 
if we move a little bit away from the U.S. stock side and go into the European stocks, I know you and I, just before this video started, talked about the FTSE. Um, you saw an interesting pattern there and you said that you really want to highlight that. So uh, the reason why I also mentioned the European stocks, specifically the FTSE, is I've been hearing just about in the market that Europe or European stocks is actually probably a better bet than the U.S. in 2023. Um, so perhaps yes. the FTSE, you can tell me what you think about that. I do. And I mean, we see that in, in the um, um, in the RRG, don't we? We see that over on the top, on the right hand side was was the uh, the SOX, the CAC, the DAX. Also, um, the FTSE was looking good. Now, on an absolute chart, starting with the FTSE, um, I, I, I wonder, you know, people sort of this crept up on a lot of people. We're close to making new all time highs on the FTSE. And uh, there aren't too many stock indices, you know, apart from Turkey and, and Pakistan, which are making new, <laughs> new, new all time highs. But um, I think the reason is, is a very similar one. <laughs> because, um, um, of course, this is a sterling based index. Um, and um, so it's a beneficiary of a, a, a relatively weak currency. Also, the, the FTSE 100 is a rather unusual index in, in that it's, it's not at all a representation of UK PLC. It, is, it isn't the UK. It's 100 stocks, many of which are miners or oil companies, foreign based dollar earning securities and that's why it's doing well is because their profits um, are in dollars and um, so the other thing about the FTSE is that it is in a way a <coughs> an actively managed fund because the, the bad stocks are always being taken out of it and it's been, they're being replaced by good stocks so it's actively managed and so it has a, um, a bias towards performing well because it's always the best performing things that are in it so um, um, it's not a surprise and it's not the best way of describing the UK, the state of the UK. I think the All Share does that uh, uh, much better. But uh, it is what people look at um, or many people look at. And um, and what we saw, uh, what we're seeing now is these break of this, these three tops in here, um, which were, uh, you know, were, um, uh, were very significant, three, four, five tops really there. And we're clearing it right, right now. And um, uh, so this is a new uh, one year high, but it, in a moment, I'm pretty um, uh, uh, confident, if I can be confident, that it's going to take out this high, the 2018, May 2018 high, and make a new high and then be hit the headlines after that. So we've already seen this, as, that if you were course this is a great index if you are a UK based person whose outgoings are in sterling and things like that the only thing that matters to you is that you know sterling and it's going up and it's it's uh, make, close to making new highs unlike for example uh, the, uh, the Nasdaq but if you express the pan the the FTSE in dollars you'd have a completely different uh, picture but um, it's about to uh, hit some big headlines I would say Right. Well, that, that is interesting. I mean, technically, people last year were saying we're in a technical recession, uh, and yet you have the FTSE um, just about to hit all-time high. And you yes. mentioned a lot about the currency market and, and the dollar. And you know, lately, we've seen the weakening of the US dollar, and that's been the catalyst for other currency pairs, uh, like the euro, pound, uh, euro dollar uh, and pound dollar um, rally up, especially after today's announcement as well. So from a currency market momentum perspective, can you give us an update uh, and then perhaps go a little bit into the charts of what could be next for each of these currency pairs? Okay, now we're looking at um, the G10 currencies versus uh, the US dollar. So the US dollar is in the middle here. So um, uh, we, you can see that the because the dollar itself is relatively Weak, not relatively, it is weak. Everything, pretty well everything, except for the Canadian dollar, is right of 100. So doing better. So we got um, um, uh, bull markets in most currencies versus the dollar due to the dollar weakness. Furthest to the right is the euro dollar. So uh, on a relative basis, this one is uh, the best looking. And as you see here, it's moving directly eastwards. So it's, uh, it's, uh, that means it's strengthening. In, in, in a relative basis. It's not moving northeasterly. Uh, if it had a northerly aspect to it, uh, then it would be with positive momentum, but it is moving, it is uh, on a relative basis, um, increasing its um, uh, good performance. Uh, fo following it is the New Zealand dollar, uh, the Swissy, 
the, the yen and the pound here, and then the uh, Scandies in here, Australian dollar and the Canadian dollar over here. So behind us are these uh, commodity uh, currencies. But um, uh, the key thing that uh, that uh, interests us is i think is the is the euro and uh, the pound and i think there's are two charts that we would like to look in a bit more detail before i do that i'd like to just look at, uh, having said the dollar is weak let's have a look at that and the best way to see it i think um, is in the dollar index the dollar index is a basket of currencies more than 60% of it is the euro so it's kind of the euro and everything else but um very interesting chart here so here is when this is going down it's the dollar going down so here's the weakness of uh, of the dollar um i just want to point out that the uh, it's coming back to this march 2020 high here and of course a long 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 uptrend line like this is going to be you know uh difficult to draw with any degree of accuracy so far apart from this point here you know small inaccuracy in drawing it has a big effect up this end of the line but it looks like we're moving we have come back to this long-term uptrend line so this fall in the dollar could conceivably um, be coming to an end except that it is at this very point increasing in its downside momentum so we've got um, this is the macd moving average convergence divergence it's going down as you can see and it's a, it's, the gap is widening between it and its signal line. And so this, is, this is, means that the, the downside momentum in the dollar is actually increasing. And here now is the relative strength index, Wilder's relative strength index, making a very, very low uh, reading down in, in here. So it's low, not because it's strong or a buy, it's low because it's actually weak. That's what puts it down there. So we... The momentum is strong on the downside. It is going down. However, it's come to uh, significant support points. These are long term. This is a weekly chart. Uh, so, sorry, it is a daily chart, but it, it is a long term um, uh, levels. They don't have to hold, um, but uh, it's, it's uh, worth noting that we are at those levels. So let, let's switch now to the euro. So the, the euro chart, you would expect this to be a more or less a mirror of this chart here. And that's what it is. So here is the um, is the euro following falling, the dollar rising. Then this is the fall in uh, in the dollar and the rise in the euro. This time we're looking at um, uh, a weekly uh, sample. So each candle here is a weekly chart. So it um, turned uh, uh, very attractive on the RRG chart um, back. Um, in at the end of la in the last quarter of last year, we picked that up and we talked about it, and um, and we broke the downtrend line on this on this chart, this downtrend channel. Sorry, we broke uh, up very powerfully. The move out of the channel was very powerful indeed. The MACD uh, crossed to the upside. Um, it's the gap is widening here, so that weakness of the dollar, you know, with the gap widening in the MACD on that, this is the equivalent here. It's strong and getting stronger. 108 is a key level. A lot of people are talking about the 108 level. We're at it quite uh, at this moment, um, and it is looking, um, you know, quite strong at it. This is a live uh, chart, and it's breaking it. Um, we're above 108. That will bring in a lot of uh, attention because a lot of people have said uh, that it uh, could stop at 108, but it's got this strong momentum in it, and um, it seems like it's likely to push ahead. So whether those support levels do hold in the end or not, I don't know. But um, the, 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 where's the resistance? That's what we should look at. I mean, it's gone up a lot already here. You'd be late um, uh, buying into the euro if you did it now. It does meet this resistance at 108. We haven't really quite cleared it. It's just moved above it, but um, you can't say it's uh, uh, really uh, put it behind it yet. Um, uh, the, there is good resistance, but I, I, I think it, it, uh, it, it can still um, push further to the next level of resistance, which is up at 110. It's got enough energy, I think, uh, to do that. 
switching now to the sterling, which you remember was behind the euro in, um, in, in the RRG chart, or left, further left than the euro in the RRG chart. And here it is here. It's, um, it's not quite so good uh, looking. Yes, it made its low uh, back at, uh, in October and uh, turned up, broke its downtrend line in the same way, came um, and broke this uh, 120 big uh, number uh, there. Uh, pushed up strongly, retraced back to 120 again, and it's uh, steadied up now to to 122 area. It's um it's it's looking good-ish, but not as good as the euro, uh, I would say. Also, it's much further down from its uh, its high, and it's got many more. It's got more layers of um, uh, resistance to get through, and so like the Nasdaq compared to um, uh, the uh, the Dow, for example, um, the, you know, you've, it's got a harder journey with more obstacles uh, th than the euro. Um, so this one, you know, if you were choosing between two or you were going to do a currency pair, euro sterling, um, uh, we should get some outperformance in that. And, uh, and if you were choosing one over the other because you had a certain amount of capital, choosing uh, how do I participate in the weakness of the dollar? Should I do pound or should I be you do euro? Then I think that um, the preference would be the euro. It's um, I was just sort of recalling as you going through this when I was younger that every pound was two dollars. Where have we got to <laughs> since then? Um, yeah. Well, then this is this is great. Um, I know that typically when we do our RRG uh, weekly videos, at the very end, we also typically scan the NDCs to highlight short-term trading opportunities. Um, I don't know if you've done that today, if you can kind of highlight to our audience what the scans show. Are there any bounce candidates in this market that you can highlight? That, that'd be great. Yes, yeah, so one of the outstanding uh, events um, of, of the end of uh, last year was this um, uh, uh, trend that we picked up, relative trend that we picked up in, in the Hang Seng, which gave us a great opportunity to be early adopters in, in this market, which had went down, look uh, here, make, making its high um, up um, uh, in 2021, the beginning of 2021, went down for two years, and then it came um, and, it, and now has broken out of this up tra channel. But we picked it up in here, um, uh, no, to be fair, uh, here, uh, we picked it up uh, that this uh, downward pressure was abating and, and of course, there was good uh, bounce opportunity here. Now it's uh, on an absolute chart. It's, uh, it's broken up, broken up very powerfully. That always makes us think that um, uh, uh, that uh, the break is good and is likely to follow through. We are coming towards resistance of 22,000, uh, just above 22,000, actually 22,500. Uh, but we're in a new uptrend low, higher, low, high, higher, low with new highs going on. So this is an uptrend. We see it too in the, in the, um, uh, in the um, MACD itself. Now, when, when we first mentioned this uh, back, uh, back in, um, in just towards the end of last year, uh, Julius did a scan um, using relative rotation um, uh, methodology. So we like the look of, 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 the, of the Hang Seng because of its um, uh, the chart, the long term downtrend and breaking up and the position uh, of a total neglect that we'd had on the ROG chart changing as it came up into the into the um, um, uh, out of the weak uh, quadrant and coming up above the 100. So this drew our attention to it, but what to do, what specifically to do. So we uh, 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 ran the, uh, the following scan. We looked for st stocks that were in the Hang Seng that were above their 50, um, uh, where the 50 day average is above the 200 day average. So in an intermediate term uptrend that that and the RRG, the individual stocks compared to the uh, Hang Seng itself were in um, uh, were heading in a northeasterly direction. So we're looking at the angle of it between naught and um, at naught and 90 degrees. So, so we of the ones which were going up, we looked for the ones in that group, the subset that were in that group that were uh, uh, moving up in a relative uh, basis, but also in uh, with momentum. And then we uh, chose, or uh, Julius uh, chose three that um, that he liked uh, the most. And, um, and we went through, through those. So I, th I propose to go through two of those, follow up on those two, on two of them. They're very similar to each other. They all broke up 
uh, but we we like the look of these ones because they had some potential and uh, Alibaba we think has, has still got more uh, potential so here is where we picked picked it up um, and um, and uh, thought that it had potential it was at the time actually the MACD was crossing so this was um, in uh, late November and early December um, uh, we saw this as a resistance level let me just uh, zoom in on this a little bit um, uh, here in fact I'll go to the daily chart I just want to take a second so here we are um, so this is um, uh, the when we did it uh, here so we broke out we hesitated a little bit we came to, we came down but uh, we were seeing that the relative uh, performance was was um, looking better for the whole group and uh, this one looked like it had great um, uh, breakout potential so it did eventually break out cleared the 90 too properly um, and then powered away here in uh, in January and a shot up and um, so it uh, uh, Alibaba has powered up as has moved up from 90 to 110 in a few sessions so we picked a good one that was preparing for a breakout it had good looking longer term technicals and it was at a breakout level and we got the impulse of it there it's coming towards resistance now at 120 uh, which we mentioned at the time that we first looked at it down at um, at uh, 86 and 87 uh, level when we were first looking at it so we'll have to see how it behaves at 120 it uh, for some people it might be the end of the trade uh, uh, for them if they have participated in it maybe they uh, you know don't want to see how the 120 level resolves itself and um, and uh, would rather uh, pay more in order to be sure that the 120 level has broken and um, and not risk uh, that this is complete and we have another one of these one two three tops um, at 120 but um, so that one just following up on on the uh, the, the uh, Alibaba um, uh, that we that we drew your attention to um, um, it's shot up and it is now approaching what was we called a target but the resistance level uh, at 120 is pretty close to it now so you must decide if you're in it already uh, whether uh, that one is has, has done enough for you or will you uh, look for it to go further i mean if it breaks the 120 it's it'll go, it'll go further i'm pretty confident about that but if you're not in it yet and um, um this one i think is is um this is uh, ANTA, I think Anta Sport is the company 2020 is the uh, 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 number for it. And um, it has got a wonderful base in here. Um, so we've got a series of lows pretty cl close together around 80, but a series of highs at 100, the round number of 100. Uh, we had this uh, bullish divergence on here, low, lower low, low, higher low, breaking the pattern of declines in here. And um, and this, um, as uh, we saw in the ROG uh, uh, selection process, that this one was looking uh, like it was strengthening, getting ready to do something. And it was in the range when we when we said that. And uh, now it's cleared the range, it's broken out. This becomes a good, strong area of support um, here. And um, uh, yes, we've got we've got some resistance at uh, 130. We've got some more resistance, not too strong, at 139. Um, and then and then we've got this rapid fall in here. So the, if we get up to that level, uh, the the rise could accelerate at that point there because it fell fast. It could rise fast um, as well with, without much um, uh, resistance. So this one looks as though it could be still in early stages of its move with a very nice solid base uh, down below.